Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. So we continue to have the joy of Easter. We've got one special thing as part of our, our chapel this morning. Um, there will be a presentation by the Women's Leadership Institute, a part of Concordia, that each year honors one student and actually a number of students who have just shown great leadership um, among our young women students. And so uh, we'll have that presentation after the message. We'll begin with the invocation, the reading. We'll sing our song after the reading. It's just a wonderful, joyful song. And, and uh, boy, this is the last time we're going to have our, our Haven musicians as part of, of chapel this year. So we're grateful. You, you may not know there's a number of bands, so it's not always the same students there. But we're thankful for, uh, for their providing accompaniment to our song as we praise God. I'll just have you remain seated as we have the invocation and the reading. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God's word is the gospel reading for this week from Luke chapter 24. That very day, two of them were going to a village called, named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to, de condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that, he had, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends in Christ, there's an old phrase that says, discretion is the better part of valor. I did not know where that came from until I looked it up. Its origin is Shakespeare's play, Henry IV, Part I. Prince Hal is looking over the battlefield and Falstaff is pretending to be dead on the battlefield and so the prince assumes that he has been killed and after the prince leaves, then Falstaff comes to life and rationalizes and says, the better part of valor is discretion, in which better part I have saved my life. By pretending to be dead, he saves his life. I suppose you could argue Falstaff's motives, but there are times when discretion goes a long way. You might even say that playing dumb is not always a bad thing. 
Final exams are not one of those times. But sometimes in the subtleties and the intricacies of relationships and in life, it's good to hold back everything you know, saying or acting on everything that you know for the sake of another person. And I take Jesus as my role model in this text, in his, both his ability to appear in just the right place at the right time, and also his ability to play dumb or pretend that he didn't know as much as he did. It's a fascinating thing, this text. It's so amazing. There are numerous times after Jesus' death and resurrection when it was convenient for him just to appear somewhere. He walked through walls and he made himself in the midst of whatever group he needed to be, and he just appeared to these two disciples who were walking to Emmaus on that evening of his resurrection, of the Resurrection Sunday. And he just kind of played dumb, as if he didn't know what they were talking about or why, and so that they could put all of the pieces together and slowly grab onto and get their head around what had happened and all these Old Testament prophecies that had said, this is going to be, and now it was. There was certainly something extraordinary that kept these two from recognizing Jesus. That's probably a whole other study of conjecture on how it is that they did not recognize Jesus who they had known. Same with Mary and others. But the fact remains that Jesus being in the right place at the right time and allowing the situation to unfold allowed these two disciples to grow in their understanding and in their faith in a way that was miraculous. But it took Jesus' discretion. There are times when it's helpful to just wait. And I have been known to act dumb on occasion. Some might argue it's not an act. But I often know things that are confidential, that are entrusted to me as a pastor because of my position. It is not my place to say them or to broadcast them. But by knowing things, I can then prepare, be ready to act appropriately when it's time. That's confidentiality, and there's a number of us that enjoy that privilege, that responsibility, and some of you students, too, will be there. There are other times when it's important to be at the right place at the right time, and I've had occasion to just happen to be walking somewhere where it is likely that I will see someone that I should see and casually ask them how they are in a very intentional way to give them the opportunity to tell me something or to get the help that they need. I wouldn't call that stalking, really. It's more discretionary placement, maybe. I don't know. So maybe the first part of this text is just calling us to have patience in our relationships with each other for the sake of another's faith so that the gospel can unfold in the way that God would have it so that it can come through to them in a way that they're taking ownership of, of faith growing. But it is an unmistakable thing in this text, and more curious than I can possibly express to you, that Jesus was clearly acting for their benefit. Verse 28 says, Jesus acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him to stay. And the Greek verb that is used there is unique. It's the only time in the whole New Testament that it's used, but it means in the rest of Greek literature, you're pretending something. You are pretending something that is not actually the case. How strange that our Lord would pretend. But he pretended for their benefit so that they could take the initiative to say that they wanted to spend more time with him. And that's the key to this whole text, I think, in some ways. It's an open invitation from Jesus as he walks in our lives and with us. And he says, do you want to spend more time with me? 
The point was that Jesus wanted them to be with him a little bit longer and in a deeper way. Do you ever get tired of spending time with Jesus? Well, you know the right answer. But in our sinfulness, we can easily say that other things take priority and it's just another chapel service and it's just another Bible study and it's just another this or that. And there are so many other things that we are called to. But what we have at Concordia are an abundance of times to spend together in the Word. And we miss them when they're gone. It's maybe how our feelings start to run in these last days of the semester. As much as we don't want more work or more tests, we still want the people to be around, don't we? We want to enjoy these precious, wonderful days, just a little more time to spend together. We don't want it to end so quickly. And that's the miracle of the resurrection, really, if you think about it, what Jesus was conveying, that when you think it's the end, it's not the end. There's so much more. That Emmaus journey ended. They got to where they were going. And even after Jesus stayed a little longer with them, the text says that he left them. And in a dramatic fashion, it even says, he vanished from their sight from their sight, poof, it was gone. In about two weeks, poof, this campus will be almost empty. Oh, there'll be a few of us rattling around here and a little remnant, but most will be gone and the dust will settle. But the journey continues even at that point, even after the goodbyes, because it's a journey not just to graduation and not just to this or that in life, but it's a journey to heaven. And it's a journey with Jesus. And there's joy all the way along. That's what God has planned for all of us. It's one that when we walk with Christ, it never ends. You know, Falstaff and that whole discretion is the better part of Valor thing. By, pre by pretending to be dead, he saved his life. Isn't it interesting that we don't have to pretend? We are dead, dead in our sins. And by acknowledging and realizing that, we are brought to life again, and it is a new life. Do you ever get tired of hearing that? Oh, maybe we preachers sometimes get in the way, and maybe it seems like it's not that exciting, but it is. And it's something we get to spend more time together always. And so I pray that we do enjoy just a little more time this semester a little more time together. May we yearn for that in Jesus' name. Amen.